From horse-drawn carriages to electric cars. Lessons from the past. It's 1904 and you're standing at the corner of Main and Hastings in Vancouver. Out of the corner of your eye you see something unusual. It looks like a carriage and it's moving, but there's no horse pulling it. What kind of magic was this? You later learn that it was one of those new contraptions called an automobile. And the one you saw was the first to arrive in BC. Fast forward by 105 years to November 2009. That's when North America's first production-ready, highway-capable electric cars arrived in British Columbia, brought in by the province of BC, the city of Vancouver, and BC Hydro. These cars performed similarly to gas-powered cars, but they had no internal combustion engine. What kind of magic was this? It's not magic, and the transition from gas-powered vehicles to electric vehicles is, in many ways, similar to the transition from the horse and carriage to the automobile in the early 20th century. There are lessons to be learned from what happened back then, and we can apply the knowledge to understand what we are going through now. In 1903, people often walked to where they needed to go, or they rode bicycles, took a trolley, or rode in a carriage pulled by a horse. The cities looked a lot different then. Although the main streets were paved or cobblestone, there were no traffic lights, and it was a free-for-all between pedestrians, trolleys, and horse-drawn buggies and wagons. And with a number of horses on the roads, you had to watch where you stepped. The sheer volume of horse manure created a host of problems. A foul odor permeated the air as the streets were lined with manure. It attracted flies, rats and other pests, contributing to the spread of disease and posing a threat to public health. While the automobile's primary appeal was not centered on solving the horse manure problem, it was soon recognized that a side benefit to the transition to the automobile was a cleaner, more efficient transportation alternative with a lower environmental impact, which ultimately helped improve the overall quality of life in big cities. Today, the transition to electric vehicles is largely driven by environmental concerns. Burning fossil fuels contributes to climate change and air pollution. Other contaminants found in internal combustion engine vehicles have only begun to be recycled properly in recent times. EVs do not contain many of these contaminants, and they do not burn fossil fuels. Developments in renewable energy will further reduce the environmental impact of the transportation system. The transition from the horse and buggy to the automobile as the primary means of transportation did not happen overnight. At first, automobiles were considered a novelty, with only the wealthy being able to afford one. They were often seen as status symbols, rather than a practical means of transportation. Those who did own an automobile used them primarily for short trips and leisure activities. They were impractical for long journeys because they could not reliably be operated on rough dirt roads, and gasoline was only sold in drugstores. The first gas station in Canada opened up on the corner of Camby and Smythe in Vancouver in June of 1907. It consisted of a 13-gallon or 15-liter kitchen hot water tank, a length of rubber garden hose, and a glass steam gauge. It was installed in an open-sided corrugated tin shed where the attendant sat on a barroom chair waiting for customers, which on a busy day he might see three. Horse-drawn carriages remained the dominant means of transportation for years to come, but gradually the scales were tipped the other way. The development of the automobile began in the late 19th century, with early pioneers like Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daelmer creating the first practical gasoline-powered vehicles. These early automobiles were expensive and unreliable, thus limiting their adoption. But by the early 20th century, technology had led to improvements in reliability and affordability and mass production. Companies like Ford introduced assembly line production methods, making automobiles more accessible. 
By the 1930s, automobiles had become a common sight in cities and towns across BC, gradually replacing horse-drawn carriages and carts as the primary mode of transportation. Although the automobile was superior to other types of mobility, widespread adoption was hindered by the lack of a supporting infrastructure. The infrastructure that was in place, designed to support accessible modes of transportation of the time, had to be transformed, and it certainly went through its growing pains. The development of paved roads and highways beyond the cities lagged behind the growth of automobile usage. As well, there were few gas stations available for refueling along the way. Sound familiar? Range anxiety is a term used to describe the resistance by some to transition to an electric vehicle for fear that they'll be stuck on the side of the road with a depleted battery, or that they can't go on a long trip in an EV because there aren't enough places to recharge. In the early days of the automobile, the fear of running out of gas might have been called refueling anxiety. Indeed, even if there were gas stations en route, most were not even open past 5 p.m. This was the case even in major cities like Vancouver up until the 1950s. Municipalities eventually passed laws requiring gas stations to remain open till 11 p.m. As automobiles proliferated, traffic management systems were required. It wasn't until the 1920s that the three-colored traffic light began to appear at busy intersections. The color red became universally accepted to mean stop. It would be another decade before automatic traffic lights were installed. In the early days, you didn't have your automobile serviced at a local repair shop, but at a bicycle repair shop, as that was where mechanical services were available. By the 1930s, local service stations became the one-stop shop for automotive service needs. And as the market for automobiles grew, and they became more complex, businesses began to specialize, eventually evolving into the repair and service infrastructure we have today. Another similarity between the adoption of the automobile and the transition to electric vehicles is the government incentives that are available to buyers. Beginning in the early 1900s, governments offered tax incentives to encourage people to buy automobiles. Early models were still very expensive and only the wealthy could afford them. If the automobile market was to grow, it needed to become more accessible to everyday people. So municipalities reduced or eliminated taxes on automobiles or lowered the registration fees. Governments also recognized the potential economic benefits for tourism, travel, and lifestyle. The automobile was promoted as a means of travel, encouraging tourists to visit and thereby boosting local economies. This included advertising campaigns, the establishment of scenic routes, and the placement of road signs to guide travelers. Today, many governments have mandated that within the next 20 to 25 years, all new vehicles sold are to be zero emission vehicles. Many governments offer incentives for the purchase of new and sometimes used EVs. The development of the charging infrastructure currently lags behind EV adoption, just like the gas station infrastructure did for the early decades of the gas-powered vehicles. And just like it did over a hundred years ago, and many times since, technology is solving problems of the past by putting an end to inferior technology. But it is a gradual process. If we want to successfully transform our transportation system and build for a better tomorrow, it will take investment, support, and time.